Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. My wife, Edna, and I had started our hike from the Seed Valley and were working our way up north into the Rogue River, Sisiku National Forest, our destination being the Red Butte Wilderness Area. Edna and I had been through this area many times and knew it probably as well as anyone on the planet. We had stayed early and made our way into what we refer to as the Red Zone by noon. We were sitting side by side on a log with our backs to a tree line facing a small field. We had been sitting quietly for about 20 minutes taking our lunch break when we heard something momentarily rustling behind us and off to our left in the trees. I had turned my head to look and saw nothing. My wife had done the same as we continued to eat. I don't mean to sound like hearing something rustling is any big deal, as there is so much wildlife in here, but every noise does and should get your attention when hiking. The two of us have stumbled across many a bear and even a cougar during our many hikes. A few minutes later, as I was pulling my nasal inhaler out of my pocket, we heard what sounded like a loud crack, followed by the sound of a tree dragging on the ground. At least that's what it I thought at the time. The two of us stood up from our seat on the log and turned to face the woods in the direction of the noise, with the trees being maybe 75 feet at best in front of us. From the position we were in, you really couldn't see into the trees to our left or our right hand side, but there was a small opening directly in front of us. We continued to look and listen as this sound of something dragging seemed to be getting closer and louder. Suddenly, a Bigfoot appeared from behind the trees to our right, walking into this opening and dragging a small tree in its right hand. As soon as it had made its way past the barrier of trees and into the opening, it turned its face to look at us and dropped the tree that it had in its hands. Turning to the right, it slowly started to walk towards the rear of the opening, retreating back into the woods. It craned its neck, looking back at us as it walked by, before it completely disappeared from view. I don't think it was but five minutes after we had seen it that we moved forward to where it had dropped the tree. Edna and I stood there, looking at the tree. It was dead but considerably large to be dragging around. It must have been easily 30 feet long and about 6 inches in diameter at the base. Why, this creature was dragging this particular tree, and to where is anyone's guess? Our own thoughts being, at the time, that it couldn't have been planning to take it very far, or else it would have grabbed another tree nearer to that location. It must have been going to or living somewhere in close proximity to where we were standing. I'm, I am sure that this Bigfoot was as surprised to see us as we were to see it, perhaps even more so. I say this because we had a fair warning, having heard it coming. To me, there was absolutely no fear exhibited by the beast when it saw us. Having seen the size of it, the reason why is more than evident. We had a more than perfect view of it for some 30 seconds or more. When we walked over to look at the tree it had been dragging, there were several boughs that we had watched it pass behind as it walked. 
all of which were in the neighborhood of eight to nine feet off the ground. This was one big mother. I can tell you that emphatically. It appeared to be almost jet black with some red highlights that were shining in the sunlight as it broke into the small clearing. From the side, it seemed to be about three feet thick from front to back, and its fingers on the left hand were hanging just below knee level. One of the oddities about it was that the head looked tiny for the body. Now, don't get me wrong, the musculature was immense in every sense of the word, but even at that, the head seemed relatively small. We couldn't really make out any muscular definition other than that everywhere you looked, the body seemed to be bulging outwards, such as the chest and the back. It was, quite obviously, built strongly to the extreme. It was casually walking, holding this tree in one hand that even dead had to have weighed at least a couple of hundred pounds or more. The other thing about the sighting, which I can't forget, is the leisurely way in which, after it had seen us, it walked away. There was absolutely no sense of fear or urgency on its part after having seen us. I guess it knows that it could tear us limb from limb if it had to. At any rate, that was our sighting of the Red Butte's Beast, as we have named him. But that wasn't all. I had been troubled since the day of the encounter as to what the Bigfoot was doing, dragging the tree around in the woods, and had decided to go back into the area and do a little investigating. My wife, Edna, wanted nothing to do with it, so I brought along my best friend, Larry, who was more than interested after having heard about the encounter. The two of us made our way in exactly as my wife and I had the other day. I knew I was at the precise location of the last sighting because I had dropped and forgotten about my nasal inhaler, only to find it lying next to the log where we had eaten our lunch. The first thing we did was to step into the opening where we had seen the beast leave the tree. It was gone. This immediately indicated to me that this Bigfoot was all business and had come back to finish what he had started after we had left. Larry and I began to do a very methodical search, expanding outward at about 20 yards at a time, working our way into the woods where the creature was heading. Our hope was to discover what the tree was being taken for without ending up dead in the process. By the way, we had both brought our handguns with us on this trip. I guess it was about two hours into this grid search that we ran across a teepee-like structure made of trees in the woods. There must have been well over 50 trees set to lean against some horizontal branches of one large living tree. As we walked around the structure, if you can believe it, I actually remember and recognized the back pattern of the one that he had dropped and saw it within the structure. As we stood there examining this phenomena, Larry said that he thought he saw something dark out of the corner of his eye and pointed in the direction he wanted me to look. Neither of us could see anything, but he was certain that he had seen some dark color move in and through a small opening in the branches. Now, Larry is a very able and experienced woodsman. If he says he saw something, he most definitely did. Dark color in these parts means bears, and perhaps during this venture, a Bigfoot. Needless to say, you don't start wandering around looking for either without handguns. Well, we had a lot to talk about and began our hike back out. We must have hiked two miles or more, bullshitting the whole time about what we had seen and what my wife and I had seen previously. I could tell that Larry had caught the bug just as I had. There is something quite extraordinary that happens to a man or woman when you see one of these creatures. Speaking for myself, it is now like I can't let it go. I want to know more and I want to see more. Anyways, so we are hiking about two miles outbound from the structure when, unexpectedly, a large and voluminous howl starts emanating from the woods directly from where we had been. We both turned to listen, and it must have went on for almost 20 seconds before it stopped. 
It was louder than a blast of a cruise ship's horn, and it had made our hair stand on end. I said that to Larry, that the Bigfoot must have given us a farewell salute. There was absolutely nothing else in this region that the sound could have been coming from. On to the next story. I'm a retired archaeologist with the state of Alaska, where I worked for most of my entire career for the Alaska Office of History and Archaeology. As you can probably imagine, I've been to more wild places than the average Joe from the Aleutian Islands to the Bering Straits. I've seen lots of interesting things, had plenty of close calls with bad weather, bears, and even a beluga whale once. But the most memorable event and frightening, I might add, of my entire 40-year career was on Yakobi Island, a place very few even know exist. I generally worked out of headquarters in Anchorage, but would go wherever the job took me. I did a lot of review and compliance work, think oil industry, so I spent a lot of time on the North Slope. But my real love was when I got to actually go do survey sites and even help excavate a site, though that didn't seem to happen very often. But I did generally enjoy the travel and exploring the magnificent state of Alaska. There's nowhere like it. Well, this one time I was down in Wano for a trial where I had been asked to be an expert witness for an ongoing legal battle between a group of natives and an oil company, and it looked like it was going to turn into a long stay, so I got interested in doing some sightseeing while there. My family always jokes that for me, sightseeing is spelled S-I-T-E, not S-I-G-H-T, as I was always out looking for archaeological sites, while of course taking in the scenic sites as well. There would be a week hiatus before I could present the rest of my evidence, which I had to do with an oil company wanting to put a haul road right over a sacred site, and I could either fly back home to Anchorage or stay and explore the area. And, in case you don't know, there are no roads to 1-0. You arrive either by air or ferry, and your car arrives by ferry or barge. So once you're there, you really don't have many places you can go. To this day, a lot of Alaskans wonder why it's the capital of the state, even after there have been several votes to move it, though it never gets done. So, I wasn't sure what to do. If I returned, I'd have to work, whereas if I stayed, I could do whatever I wanted for a week. Kind of like a little vacation, though one where I couldn't really go anywhere, much because I was in 1L. The idea of staying sounded kind of good on one hand, but on the other, I might get pretty bored and have nothing to do. I can tell you right now that in many ways, I now wish I had gone back to Anchorage and worked. There are some kinds of excitement that aren't worth it. I also knew that I could potentially get stuck there because of bad weather, so I needed to see what the forecast was for, though I suspected it called for at least some rain, as it usually does. I don't know if you've ever been to Wano, but it's basically a rainforest. Because of the Pacific Ocean being nearby, it gets lots of rain, anywhere from 50 to 90 inches a year, and it rains there about 320 days a year, and can get cold in the winter, but not as severe as most of Alaska. Anyway, I decided to wander down to the library and see what I could find out what there is to do in the Wano area, as well as read some of the history. If it looked interesting, I would stay for the week. If not, I'd fly home the next day. As I'm talking about this, I'm trying to recall when all of this happened. I'd been retired about six years, so I believe it was probably around 15 years or so. I'm an old codger, and believe it or not, when I went to college, we actually had to physically go to the library to do research, as there was no such thing as the internet. So for me, doing research meant going to the library. I've always liked libraries and had good associations with them. 
Well, there I sat in the Wano Library looking through Alaska's tourist magazines and books about things like how to photograph the northern lights. There wasn't much on Wano itself, and I was getting the impression that there really wasn't a lot to do there unless you were a cruise ship tourist and into shopping and eating out. I decided to see if there might be some old historical sites I could visit. I pulled some old history books out of the stacks and kicked back with the rain pouring down outside. It was kind of a magical moment, and I guess I felt transported back to my college days when I was getting my PhD in anthropology at the University of Washington. I had asked the librarian to see what kind of historical information they had about the area, and she came in and whispered, how far back in history do you want to go? As far back as possible, I replied. Russians? Sure, why not? Alaska was originally claimed by the Russians, and the hired Danish explorer, Vitus Bering, was the first to claim ownership on their behalf. He left his name on many landmarks, such as the Bering Straits. In 1867, the U.S. purchased the state from Russia for $7.2 million. The librarian continued, We have a book of the journals of George Steller, German naturalist on Bering's 1740 expedition. He talks about their exploration of this area. I know Steller was considered the pioneer Alaskan naturalist, but I didn't know much about him. And we also have some of the writings of Alexei Chirkov, who is one of Bering's captains, she added. Before long, I was reading the Journal of a Voyage with Bering, 1741-1742, to by Steller. It was interesting, but I soon decided it was a bit much for the casual research I felt like doing. The librarian had also brought me stuff by Cherkov, but it seemed to be more of the same. I mean, it's all very interesting reading, but you need to be in the mood, not to mention sitting in a comfortable chair, which I wasn't. I was getting ready to leave when a younger guy sitting across from me asked if he could look at the Cherkov stuff. I guessed from his high cheekbones that he was native. Who is this guy anyways? He asked. His name sounds familiar. I was surprised. The young guy looked like he'd be into playing video games more than reading hardcore history, but I told him what I knew. Oh, I know why he seems familiar, the guy said. He's the captain who lost a bunch of his shipmates out on Yakobi Island, or at least that's where they think it happened. Where's Yakobi Island? I asked, and how do you lose your shipmates? It's almost due west, across the strait from here, part of the Alexander Archipelago. And how do you lose people? Well, you send them off the main ship in a longboat looking for fresh water. And when they never come back, you send more guys in your last remaining dory. Cherkov lost 15 men without his longboat and dory. The guys on the main boat couldn't get to shore and almost died of thirst. I was surprised and asked, how do you know all this? He gazed at me for a moment, then replied, I'm an anthropology student at the university. I'm also a tinglet, and Bering was responsible for killing a lot of my people. Our oral histories say that strangers landed on the Takanese, what everyone else called Yakobi. No kidding, I replied, feeling like I just won the history lottery. There's a place there with a lot of tinglet petroglyphs, and one has a big ship with two masts. There's also a halibut and eagle petroglyphs, and salmon. Have you been there? I asked. Yes, several times. Would you take me there? It just popped out, and I couldn't believe it. I was asking a complete stranger to take me on an expedition to a remote Alaskan island, and I didn't even know his name. All I knew that he was a tinglet and an anthropology student, but that was all I needed to know. I'm Hugh. I held out my hand. I'm Jackson, he replied, shaking my hand. People of the tides, I said, mostly to myself. Yes, the tinglet. Jackson looked surprised. I'm an archaeologist with the state, I added. Jackson smiled. I'll take you out, but you have to pay for everything. I'm just a poor college student. Not a problem, I said. And you have to promise not to share what you see with anyone. I paused. What if it's of significance? What if my sharing of it will mean saving it? That seldom happens, and you know it, Jackson answered. You share things, and soon they're destroyed. You have to promise 
No photos either. I was quiet. Jackson added, maybe I shouldn't do it. That way there's no risk. I wasn't sure if he was talking about risk for us or a risk that I would betray his trust. Finally, I said, okay, I promise, but you don't have to do it if you feel uncomfortable. I know the petroglyphs are on Surge Bay, but nobody can ever find them. Have you tried? Jackson asked. No. Jackson said, I have to arrange a boat. It will cost. My cousin will take us out. Give me your number and I'll call you later. I walked back to my hotel, feeling like I'd just been in an Indiana Jones movie scene. The one with an unlikely meeting before some ensuing wild adventure. The odds against someone like Jackson and I meeting seemed huge, and yet they probably really weren't. I was in the history section of the library, so it made sense that someone else interested in history would be there. Southeast Alaska was the heart of Tinglet territory, and Wano had a college, so meeting a Tinglet who went to school there wasn't that big of a stretch either. And as an archaeologist, I had heard there were petroglyphs on Yakobi Island, though I had never met anyone who knew exactly where they were. I had also heard of the lost village of Aposovo, which was the Tinglet village on Yakobi mentioned in historical document, which had never been found, although I learned later that there is evidence of human occupation near the petroglyphs on Surge Bay. Some think the village was victim of smallpox, but after going there, I have my own theory, which you'll soon understand. In any case, Yakobi Island seemed to have lots of mysteries, and little did I know that Jackson and I were about to discover a few more. My time in Wano would be as far from boring as one could possibly get. And so, the next day, I found myself on an old fishing boat motoring across Cross Sound, slowly making our way the 80-some miles from Wano to Yakobi. The weather looked good for once, but the currents looked tricky. Jackson assured me that his cousin, Chris, had fished there many times for halibut and knew where every rock and undertow in the sound was located. Chris had that air of nonchalance that one has who has done something a million times. I would be happy if he'd done it at least a thousand or even a hundred. The water in the sound was choppy, and I was happy to know a Coast Guard helicopter wasn't too far away over on Cape Spencer, though I later found out it's basically abandoned with maybe all of the ten landings a year, mostly by rescue choppers, but ignorance was bliss, and it lent a feeling of security, albeit false of what turned out to be an exercise by puny humans in a land of deep rainforests surrounded by even deeper oceans. I couldn't even see Yakobi in the distance, a black mass against the dark ocean, and when it gradually came into better view, I could tell it looked black because of the density of its vegetation. Waves crashed endlessly against its high, rocky cliffs, lending an ominous, distant sound to the landscape. I suddenly felt like a fool to be out in such extremes with what basically amounted to two young men and an old fishing boat. We didn't even have adequate flotation devices as the straps were rotting away. We boated out from the sound to the edge of the deeper Pacific Ocean waters, obvious by the change of color from blue to black, then turning south and began skirting the island. What I had seen so far of Yakobi Island made me think that no one in their right mind would attempt a landing there with so many rocky points and cliffs and half-sunk spires, and yet that was exactly what we were going to do. I half expected to end up like Cherkov's missing men. It seemed obvious, now that we were there, that their boats must have sank. Jackson assured me that he and Chris had landed several times in Surge Bay and knew the route well, but I felt a sense of gravity like I had been extremely careless in this particular undertaking. All I could do was hope I would live to regret it. Like everything else on this trip, I later found out that Surge Bay is named that for a reason and is extremely dangerous when the tide is ebbing. In fact, a number of historians believe that Cherkov's missing men probably drowned trying to make landing. In addition, winds can quickly ram a boat into the rocks along the channel. If I'd known then what I know now, I would never have gone. But like I said, ignorance is bliss. 
But even in my ignorance, I wasn't feeling very blissful. I had a knot in my stomach the entire time, and instead of it going away, it only got bigger, even after Jackson and I successfully landed in a small inflatable raft on the banks of a small cove inside Surge Bay. Immediately, something was telling me to get back in and leave, and the sight of a yellow inflatable kayak hanging high from a tree didn't help any. High tides here? I asked. Not that high, Jason replied. I knew that there were places in Alaska that had 30-foot tides, but the kayak appeared to be tied up, not the result of being lifted into the tree by tidewater. Someone tied it up like that, Jackson commented, examining the knot intentionally. Why would they do that? I asked. Bears? He replied. So they don't bite and puncture it, trying to figure out what it is? I thought bears can climb, I said wryly. Black bears climb. Brownies can, but don't like to. Have you seen brown bears here? I asked, my sense of doom growing exponentially. They're all over the island, Jackson replied. They're good swimmers. There's blackies too. I could now see that Chris, who had not entered the bay, had turned the fishing boat and was heading further south, going around the island. Hey, I cried. Where's he going? He's going to fish for a few hours while we explore, Jackson said. That was the only way I could get him to bring us. I thought I was paying him. That too, I groaned, then picked up my day pack, which held water, a rain jacket, a small first aid kit, a notebook, and some sandwiches and cookies, and no camera. Jackson tied the boat up to a large rock. How do we keep bears from eating our raft, I asked. We don't have any rope for hanging it in the trees. We won't be going far, Jackson replied, and I have this. He touched the stock of the rifle slung over his shoulder. We walked a ways down the beach and were soon standing by a round rock with a drawing of a fish incised into it. The figure was old and faded, but obviously a salmon. And as we walked further, Jackson pointed out similar etchings on other rocks. An eagle, a sun, a halibut, another salmon, and then a small petroglyph that looked newer, not quite as faded as the rest, of a sailing ship with two masts and what appeared to be four oars. I stood transfixed, and what I knew was possibly the only record of the first landing of non-native in western North America. I hadn't expected to have as much of an effect on me as it did, but then I'm an archaeologist, so what would I expect? Things that other people find boring caused me to tear up. Jackson seemed to notice. He said, I have something else to show you. It's very sacred, but I think you will understand. I wasn't sure what he meant by that, so I didn't ask. Where is it? He nodded toward the snow-covered mountains in the distance. Way up there? We don't have time, I replied. I told Chris we might go. He'll wait. It won't get dark for a long time. We are just going to go to that near one, the big ridge. Can we get back to Wano in the dark? I was feeling like the whole thing was going from sketchy to outright dangerous. No, we'll set anchor and sleep on the boat, but you must remember that we're people of the canoe. My people floated and explored and lived here for many years before we had motors. We know the waters. Archaeologists like you say we've been here over 10,000 years, some think much longer. I nodded, suddenly feeling very humble and even fortunate to have been taken in by this young tinglet. We won't get lost? I asked, eyeing the thick forest. We'll use animal trails. What about the raft? It'll be fine, Jackson replied. I didn't know what to say, so I said nothing, wondering where the person was who owned the kayak hanging from the tree. Probably lost. We crossed the beach and immediately entered the dark forest. Jackson quickly found a rough trail that led through the trees. We startled a Sitka black-tailed deer, which ran through the forest, and I was amazed at how quick it was. I read later that we were near the West Chikov Yakobi Wilderness, which is part of the Tongass National Forest, the largest national forest in the United States and part of Earth's largest remaining temperate rainforest. The trees are primarily western red cedar, Sitka spruce, and western hemlock. The average American has no idea that this forest, spread over thousands of islands, is part of their country. I certainly didn't. Jackson led as we pushed our way through the forest, skirting a large lake that he called Surge Lake. It opened into Surge Bay. 
So it was salt water. We were beginning to climb, and the more we ascended, the less vegetation we had to deal with, until, after a couple of hours, we stood on tundra at the top of a large ridge that overlooked the lake and bay. I could see the small cove we had landed in far below, our raft a mere dot on the landscape, the kayak above it a yellow glint. I kept expecting to run into a bear, but we were lucky and didn't. I later read that the West Chickagov Yakobi Wilderness is home to a unique group of brown bears that are more closely related to polar bears than to other brown bears. Knowing how polar bears view humans as prey, I was glad we hadn't had the chance to see if these brownies had the same propensity. We walked to the edge of the ridge where it plunged straight into rainforest and Jackson showed me a large pile of gray rocks, many green with moss. The mound was obviously artificial and I knew we were looking at a tinglet rock cairn. It had been built on the very edge of the mountain. Jason looked thoughtful. Our oral traditions tell of an ancient flood. It drove our people from their coastal homes up into the mountains. We had to use rafts, and these rock cairns were used to anchor and save us. I nodded with respect. He continued, These stories are told by our Tinglet elders and are passed down for generation upon generation. These cairns are all over the islands. Here and some places have as many as 30 or 40 mounds. Thank you for bringing me here. I can feel how special it is, I replied, and there's an awesome view too. As I gazed back down to Surge Bay, my eye caught movement. Jackson noticed I was watching something and also looked. It's a bear, I exclaimed. Something large and dark was down by our raft. We watched as it appeared to be messing with the rafts, though it was too far to see what was really going on. Being in the field a lot, I always carry a small monocular in my pocket, and I got it out. Something seemed very strange, and I watched as the bear, walking on two legs, appeared to be carrying our raft to the edge of the cove. It seemed impossible. Jackson, take a look at this. I handed him the monocular. He watched for some time, then said nervously, Kutsalan. Some call it Kushtaka giant hairy man. I always thought they were just a myth, even though my grandfather said he had seen them. Big trouble, Hugh, big trouble. It just sent our raft out to sea. A chill went down my spine. Do you think the yellow kayak is still there? Jason looked through the monocular for a long time, then said, it looks like it is. Maybe the Kutsalan doesn't see it up in the tree. We both sat there in disbelief. A hairy man? I finally asked. Some old miner or hermit? I knew better, but I wanted to hear it from Jackson. No, Hugh. It's what some call Bigfoot or Sasquatch, or maybe even Yeti. Not a human, but very human-like. Very large and powerful and dangerous. Much worse than a grizzly, as it's much smarter and more cunning. Maybe we can get out in the kayak, I said, hopefully. Maybe, but what about its owner? He may not like that. How do we know that whoever put it there is even still alive? With that thing down there, what do you call it? Kutzlan? Maybe it's already got him. Jackson looked even grimmer. Maybe I should have known better, he said. I'd heard that they were on Chickagoff and nearby islands. They can swim. There are many islands and few people. Maybe that's what really happened to Chirkov's men. Kutzlan, I said. My grandfather thinks so, Jackson replied. Well, Jackson, you're the one who knows the territory. What now? Jackson held the monocular back up. After a while, he said, the raft's gone. I think it's been punctured, as it's not floating anywhere that I can see. The Kutzlan is now walking down the beach exactly where we went. It may be trying to track us. Do you think your rifle would stop it? I knew the answer. It just wasn't big enough for a creature that huge. Jackson replied, no, and we could never outrun it. Yakobi is about 80 square miles. It's too big to just hike across to another beach and hope someone sees us. Where's the thing now? I asked, still on the beach. 
I was now wishing I had gone home after all, instead of deciding to explore a place I shouldn't be in. The sun was now beginning to drop closer to the horizon. I didn't really want to be out here in the dark, and worse yet, I could see a low bank of dark clouds way out on the western horizon. I had carefully checked the weather before we headed out, but things can change quickly. Who knew if it was just a small squall coming in or a major storm. What will your cousin do if we don't show up before dark, I asked. He'll wait. If we're not back by late, he'll call the Coast Guard. He can't make a landing as we have the only raft, or had, I should say. I said nothing, taking the monocular from Jackson and looking for the Bigfoot. It's gone, I said with a sinking feeling. I have a hunch, and it's not a good one, I added. Yeah, me too, Jackson replied. I really think it's tracking us, and it won't be long before it's here given its size. Would this sacred site provide us with some protection? I wasn't superstitious, but I also didn't want to insult Jackson's belief. I added, maybe we should keep going. Go where, he asked. Think about it. We're on the top of a steep ridge. It's the best defensive place you can find. But also very visible, and if that storm comes, it may not be the safest. We don't have much time to act. If it is coming for us, Jackson said standing, we may want to use humankind's oldest ally, fire. Let's go. Jackson was now scrambling down to the more gentle section of the ridge, and I followed. The ridge wasn't even close to being the highest on the island, and fingers of the forest almost grew to its top. He was soon picking up pieces of logs and dragging them top of the hill by the cairn. I followed suit. We worked like bad men, dragging wood up until we had a substantial pile. Some of it was damp, but Jackson assured me it would burn if got hot enough. We could put the damp wood in with the dry, and it would eventually catch. Now Jackson set to rearranging the cairns, making a sort of fort. I bit my tongue, wondering what the Tinglet elders would think of such desecration. The cairn is sacred, and its sacredness will provide us protection. There are many ways for such protection to work, Jackson said as if he knew what I was thinking. I started helping Jackson stack the rocks, and we soon had a somewhat defensive structure, though it would have no roof. We were now dragging all the wood next to it, and Jackson stacked some into the pile ready to light. We're as ready as we're going to be, he said, sitting down on a rock inside the fort. We'd been working for about an hour. It took us about two hours to get here, and the Kutsalan will be here at least twice as fast as we are, so it should be here soon. We had worked so hard that I'd lost track of time, but I could now see that the sun was setting on the horizon. I looked down at the spine of the ridge we were on, wondering if the Bigfoot were really after us. If it were, it had to walk along the spine as the cliffs below of the cairn were too sheer to climb. As I was scanning the ridge, top with my monocular, I saw movement. Sure enough, something was coming. I couldn't make out much except that it was black. It's coming, I said. Jackson lit the fire with a lighter from his pocket, and I could tell he was a skilled firemaker, as he'd placed dry wood in the center, then surrounded it with kindling and pieces so small that they were sure to catch right away in a trail leading to the center. The fire was soon ablaze, lighting up the surrounding dusk. I thought again of Cherkov's men, then of Chris out on the street waiting for us, probably wondering what was going on. The fire seemed to have no effect on the dark figure, and if anything, it was now coming faster. I could see Jackson holding his rifle ready, as we both knew it would only serve as a deterrent. As it approached, the figure was beginning to look human. I instinctively yelled, Hello out there, who are you? Hey, a voice shouted back. Can I join you? Yes, come on in, Jackson yelled. Hurry. With the suddenness that comes when one steps into the light from darkness, the figure stood at the edge of our fort. It was a man, maybe in his thirties, dressed in expensive high-tech clothing, you know, the kind that you pay a fortune to advertise their brand for them, on your sleeve. He looked like he was about to collapse, so I motioned for him to sit on a rock 
I'd been leaning against. I thought I saw people over there, but I wasn't sure until you lit the fire. I thought maybe it was another of those giant bear things. He was puffing, catching his breath before continuing. I've been on this damn island for two days, totally lost. I hitched my sea kayak up to a tree to keep the bears away from it, but now I can't find it. Every beach looks the same. Every bay, every cove, they all look the same. I was going to explore for an afternoon. Would you happen to have anything to eat? I pulled out a couple of granola bars and handed them to him. We're running a little short ourselves, Jackson said, handing him a sandwich. We intended to leave about two hours ago. Have you had anything to drink? Yes. At least there's plenty of rainwater, the man answered, slumping down against the big rock, as close to the f flames as he could get without catching fire. Jackson kept feeding the flames while I nervously scanned the darkness along the spine of the ridge, watching for a moment. The man said his name was Daniel, and he was a wildlife photographer from Calgary. He'd flown into nearby Sitka and had been kayaking his way around the many islands in the West Chickagoff Yacobi Wilderness, intending to eventually head over to Wano. All his gear was in his kayak, hanging somewhere from a tree, and the story he told us next was chilling. He landed in the same little cove we'd used in Surge Bay, unaware of the danger, and after seeing a big brown bear down on the beach, he decided to hoist his kayak up into the trees. He then hung around hoping to get some photos of the bear, who was salmon fishing on the rocks, paying him no mind. But the bear had stopped, turned its nose to the air, and suddenly fled. Daniel had thought this was very odd, especially since he suspected it was a male who aren't afraid much of anything. He figured a more dominant male was in the area, and grizzly males sometimes kill each other. Sure enough, he spotted what looked like a very large bear standing back in the shadows, as if not wanting to be seen. This really scared him, for he somehow had a hunch the bear saw him as prey and was stalking him. He wasn't sure what to do, because he was completely unarmed and didn't even have any bear spray. The bear was between him and his kayak, so he slipped into the trees, hoping to somehow evade it, but then he was terrified as he could hear the animal following him. Daniel was a professional wildlife photographer, and he knew that even Though black bears are good climbers, brown bears aren't, so he decided to climb a tall cedar. He knew if he could get above 20 or 30 feet, the bear wouldn't want to follow him. After climbing a good 40 feet or more, he got afraid that he might fall and hunched back into the tree, watching and waiting. What he saw next was beyond belief. A huge animal with very thick shoulders walked directly under him, never looking up, continuing on. And even though he had his camera, he was afraid to take photos as he didn't want the shutter noise to alert the animal to where he was. He said he was so shocked and scared that he spent the night in the tree, but the animal never came back. He finally climbed down and went back to the beach looking for his kayak so he could leave. But his kayak seemed to be missing. He paced the beach back and forth looking for it, then finally concluded he'd somehow gotten turned around and come to the wrong spot. He'd walked down another small cove where he resumed his search. It was there that he found the tracks. They were not bear tracks. They actually looked human, except they were huge and deep. This frightened him so much that he again fled for the trees, climbing as high as he could go. It was now late afternoon, and after a while, thirst drove him down. He knew he had to get away from the ocean and find some fresh water somewhere, so he began hiking up into the forest. Of course, it doesn't take long to find water in a rainforest, and soon he found a small stream and drank from it. He stayed put by the stream, trying to decide what to do next, but he really didn't seem to have many options. He'd left his emergency personal locator beacon with his stuff in the kayak. As he sat there, he heard what sounded like a monkey chatter, followed by what sounded like something hitting a tree with a big piece of wood. Well, he was soon back up another tree where he spent his second night. By then, his desperation and hunger had changed to a real fear that he would die on Yakobi Island. The next morning, he again went back to the beach, but still could not find his kayak. However, he did find something of interest, our tracks. That's when he decided to track us, but he also found it's very difficult to track anyone or anything in a rainforest and soon lost us. He wanted to yell or get our attention, but he was afraid he would be found by the big black thing. So he trudged along, hungry and tired and scared. 
He finally decided to climb a ridge and see if he could spot us, which he did. The exact same ridge we were on. He had no idea who we were or why we were there, but he did know that we were his only hope for rescue. He said he nearly stepped off the narrow ridge several times, running to catch us, in the near dark. Of course, it took Daniel some time to get his story out between eating and drinking and catching his breath while he was telling it. I continued to scan the ridge to see signs of the creature as Jackson fed the fire. I finally turned my back to the fire, looking out to the deep purple that was the Pacific Ocean. Jackson, look, could that be Chris? I could make out a small light that looked like a boat riding on the edge of Surge Bay. Jackson stood from where he was, squatting by the fire, and looked. It took his eyes a while to get used to the dark, but then he said, It's a plane or something coming in. I held up my monocular again, but it was too hard to spot anything in the darkness. I eventually saw what Jackson was seeing, and we both heard it at the same time. A chopper. Had Chris somehow called in an SOS for us? Soon, the flap, flap, flap sound of two huge rotors became deafening thump, thump, thumps as the chopper headed straight for us. It had seen our fire. I won't go into the details, but it was indeed a rescue chopper, a big Coast Guard MH-60T Jayhawk out of air station Sitka, and soon our perch on the ridge was bathed in a blue light followed by a crewman coming down on a cable to assess our situation. Daniel and Jackson were soon in the chopper, each riding up in a basket. I went up last after carefully putting out the fire. It was quite the ride up in that basket, I can tell you, and just as we headed out, a heavy rain set in. We eventually ended up in Sitka, then Wano. Chris slept in his boat in the storm near Surge Bay, then motored his way back the next day in his boat. Daniel never did get his kayak back, but he didn't seem to care. And last I knew, he was headed home on a plane out of Wano International Airport. I holed up in my hotel for a day, then decided I wanted to go home for the rest of the time before the trial reconvened. I called Jackson and invited him to dinner at the Red Dog Saloon, where I handed him a wad of bills. He took them reluctantly, saying he was a poor student or otherwise he wouldn't accept the money, as he considered me his friend. I told him it was well worth the adventure, not to mention having a good story to tell. Besides, Chris needed to buy gas. But before we parted ways, I told Jackson I was a little disappointed, as I'd been hoping to see a Kutzlan up close up there on the Yakobi, even though I was scared to death. Don't be sorry, he said. Seeing one very close is considered to be very bad luck. Be glad you didn't. I guess that's good then, but one last thing. Did you hear what the Coast Guard crewman said after he hoisted me up? No. He asked me about the other big guy down there on the back of the ridge anyways. Jackson looked shocked. What did you say? I told him it was a bear. He acted like he didn't believe me, but when the chopper lights hit it, he quickly closed the bait and told the pilot it was all clear. I'm actually very glad I didn't see it. Yeah, me too. Jackson was quiet for a while, then said, Well, it's been interesting. Best of luck, and so much for Yakobi Island. He nodded goodbye and walked out of the restaurant door as I ordered another bottle of Alaskan Hopothermia Pale Ale. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!